Hi everyone! Hello! So I've just pulled up at Wellington Equestrian Centre today because I'm going to meet with Charlie Unwin. So I went last week to a talk um, over in Amersham um, and it was really really good, really interesting um, talk. I've written a blog about it which I will put the link below for anyone that's interested. Um, but today I've come to meet him um, to sit and have a chat, find out a bit more about him, maybe come away with some interesting sports psychology tips. Looking forward to it. Clubhouse here, so I will be distracted by lots of shopping and lots of cake. You can never have too much cake. But I'm all set up when Charlie arrives. Sit down and have a chat. Right. Hello. Thank Hi. you for joining me. No, not at all. So, tell us about you. Who are you? Why are you, <laughs> why are you here? <laughs> um, well, uh, it's a good question, actually. Uh, <laughs> if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would probably would have said I'm a soldier. If you'd right. asked me uh, 12 years ago, I would have said I'm an athlete. If you'd asked me um, eight years ago, I'd say I was a budding sports psychologist, and, and that's kind of where I've, I've kept my focus and attention. Um, and in particular, performance psychology as well, which it kind of focuses on, on the psychology of excellence, if you like, and the, the psychology of high achievers and high performers, not just in equestrian sport, but also in other sports. I work a lot in rugby at the moment. Um, I've worked with about five of our Olympic, different Olympic sports and Olympic teams. Uh, but also a lot of business, the corporate world as well. Anywhere where people are trying to be the best they can be. Yeah. So in the equestrian world, what are the kind of common issues people are <clears throat> coming to you with? <laughs> it, 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 it's a good question because I, I think often what people come to me with is kind of different to what they to what they leave having having ended up doing or focusing on. Yeah. Uh, people talk a lot about confidence, for example, and I think most people relate to confidence. Yeah. When you look at sporting performance, confidence is the single uh, biggest factor of, uh, mental factor of performance. If you're not confident, you're not going to perform, perform well. And I think with confidence, it allows people to, to stay f to stay focused, make the right decisions, think clearly, control their emotions. So, so confidence allows us to regulate ourselves in so many ways. Mm. Um, so I think people relate to confidence. They feel confidence. Uh, nerves are obviously another one. So they're, they're probably the two sort of biggest areas where people come, come to me. But I, I suppose I, I have a slightly different take on those things. I don't often talk about nerves. I don't often talk about confidence. But when you start to get underneath the surface of those things, you start to appreciate that there are loads of components um, in us and in our environment as well, yeah. which kind of influence those things. And when you start to unpick those and start to help everyone see themselves as a unique individual, um, then I think it makes people a lot more positive uh, about those areas. So do you think confidence is almost a result <coughs> of better training, being aware of yourself, it all kind of comes together differently then. Yeah, aware awareness is a good word, definitely. Uh, it, it's um, when, when you look at people, and if you've got, say, a professional rider to track the times in their career when they felt most and least confident, yeah. um, typically, I, I would imagine, that they would have a sort of continuous rise in confidence as they learn more as they get better at what they do and is basically is the effort they put in translates into results and outcome yeah. so as long as those two things are in sync with each other i think people feel good about themselves and as a result they kind of approach everything with a lot more confidence yeah. but of course you get to the higher levels and you start to really get into that stretch zone of what you're capable of what the horse is capable of and inevitably you kind of get dips uh, in, not necessarily dips in performance, but maybe a result doesn't go your way. Maybe something happens, maybe something challenges the way that you think about things or it challenges your system. 
and as a result, it kind of just questions. It it, it just puts a, a question mark on yeah. on that, and and things can move out of sync. You start to question yourself: Am I doing the right thing? So everyone has experienced dips in confidence, yeah. but being able to regulate that over an extended period of time becomes the challenge, I think, of a professional. Yeah, I actually have video footage of myself having that exact moment a few <laughs> years happens? ago. I was jumping, I'm very happy, you know, my coloured pony pie, for all pie, pie fans, pie. was um, doing very, very well. Yeah. I went to a show, and just as I went to the ring, someone went, have you qualified? And I said, for what? And they were like, well, this is the Horse of the Year show qualifier. I said, is it? Oh, okay. Went in the ring and just froze. Just went, okay. And I actually trotted into a fence. <laughs> Literally, he fell into trot and I just let him trot into it. And I actually finished my round and I saluted the judge. And you just see me just go... <laughs> of what was I doing and it was like it was that it was that step up where I just went I don't know what I'm doing so when you look back on that what do you think actually happens it was just overthinking everything naturally I've been jumping the same yeah. the fact it was a horse of the year show qualifier or not didn't actually matter I yeah. bought the course and was happy but it is funny that you just have those moments where you yeah go. yeah but I think because I had it on video and saw myself go yeah. yeah, I have to find that video. Um, so, because the, uh, yeah, there are a couple of things in there that I find really interesting. One is uh, something I call uh, an inside-out versus outside-in mindset. So, so yeah. I talk about it a lot in my in my talks, and and I've spent time with uh, riders who, when they talk about them at their best, or as they've accelerated through the levels and got better quicker, there's been a real focus or an investment on the controllable aspects of their performance on the little things that they're trying to get better at yeah. riding becomes something which is just continuous improvements it's that it's those incremental differences you make in little areas of your game whether it's just keeping a balance accuracy or precision uh, maintaining the right pace in the horse uh, the feel, being able to relax, all these are little things mm. which if you get better at them incrementally, they, they all add up. Yeah. So, so of course, when we're a beginner, when we're going through the ranks, we, we tend to be invested in those things and the outcomes just kind of happen as a result. But then you get the element of expectation. You kind of start to know what you're capable of doing. And in your scenario, you became, someone made you aware of the outcome which for me kind of fits on the outside yeah. of that process bubble. Yeah. And as a result, your attention gets drawn away um, and your awareness of that means that you start to kind of very consciously control everything, which, which isn't really what we do when we're at our best, is it? No. What we do is we kind of just feel the performance. Um, yeah. It becomes something which is, uh, well, when people say they've got it, um, well, they've got it just right they talk about flow flow performance yes. and um, it's an amazing place to be but that does lead on to another part um, which is around overthinking so you mentioned overthinking there. Yeah. it's not a great thing it's to do bit. is it no. and a lot of people say oh, psychology you know is it not a danger that it's overthinking things yeah. um, and for me it's not I think we can go down the route and get confused sometimes by the notion of overthinking if you're on a horse trying to do something relatively complex or precise or quick, yeah. we don't want to be thinking too much because the conscious process is so much slower than the intuitive process. Yeah. <coughs> so, so actually, at that point in time, now of course we don't want to be overthinking. We want to just be feeling, going with it. But there's an element of trust that goes with that. And the more you care about the outcome, the more difficult it is to relinquish control over the conscious processes, you know, of controlling every element of that performance. So we get this kind of paradox in performance, which kind of stops us from being at our best. Where psychology, I think, where it is important to think a lot about what we do, is more around the edges of our performance. In particular, um, as a precursor to our performance, the ability to plan and carefully consider what is it I'm trying to do here? What yeah. do I want it to feel like? 
um, part of the coursework, for example, I talk a lot about mental simulation, visualization, and the research that's coming out in that is you know, amazing. But also after the event itself, after a training session, after a competition, being able to sort of critically analyze, well, what happened there? Why did that happen? Um, and especially when you've done well as well, because at the end of the day, performance psychology is about repeating what you are best at, yeah. um, and therefore being consistently good. Okay, so if you have, let's say, a girl who has totally lost her confidence, what would you do? <laughs> simple question. <laughs> It's a simple question. Yep. Unfortunately, there's no simple answer oh. either. <laughs> uh, if, the, if there was, um, we'd probably find it all a lot easier. Yeah. Um, co confidence can be tied up in so many things. So I, I, tend to, I tend to find myself working on three levels with people. And it will be important for me to understand on which level confidence mm -hmm. is perhaps being undermined. So yeah. on a kind of relatively surface level, there's strategies uh, that they adopt so that's kind of what they do so we might for example lose confidence on our ability to do something and it may be uh, something which is quite technical for example uh, th this happens a lot in show jumping I'd say because I just I think people see show jumping as, as uh, one of the more technical equestrian sports um, in terms of precision and if you get it wrong it can look pretty awful so yep. <laughs> so <Been there. laughs> yeah and yeah. and and so people get caught up in um in the technical aspects and, and they can lose confidence very easy in seeing a stride or something like that so so that's kind of confidence on a fairly strategic or a technical level um but then there's mindset. Mindset is the attitude we adopt towards a certain situation. So it's how we're predisposed to think of a situation. Um, and uh, the example, I suppose it's easier to use, is the difference between pessimists and optimists, mm -hmm. where uh, a pessimist may, may see what they do wrong all the time. Now, the problem with that is that we need to challenge ourselves. We're going to get better. We have to challenge ourselves. We, we've got to, if we just work within our comfort zone, all we're doing is we're continually demonstrating to ourselves that we can do this, yeah. which is great. It makes us kind of feel warm inside and fuzzy inside, but it's not actually making us better at what we do. So as, as our demands or the demands of our environments put more pressure on us, we, we don't necessarily have the confidence in ourselves or our own ability. Um, and and then, you, then that can lead into the third level, which is identity. It's kind of how you see yourself. Yeah. And I suppose that the deepest levels at which people can lose confidence is, is really around how they see themselves as a person. And the interesting thing about equestrian sports is that this is kind of tied up in, in more than just their riding. For example if they are struggling with their business, if they're struggling with owners, for example, if, um, if, they've, uh, if they've had a bad experience on social media and, and they kind of lose confidence in themselves, yeah. it kind of then affects their riding and their ability to kind of stay focused and stay confident in their process, their strategy of getting better. So you've got strategies, you've got mindsets, and you've got identity, and the first thing I'd need to do is kind of identify, well, what's what's going on here? What's the sort of interplay between these things? Yeah. So once you, you talk through those areas and then focus, does, do people tend to have all three or do they tend to have one? Or how, do, how does that work? <laughs> well, I, I probably would very rarely talk through those with anyone. Yeah. I'm obviously talking about them now, but, but what I'm doing and what I'm saying now wouldn't necessarily be the way that I'd work w with a rider. Yeah. Um, I certainly wouldn't be doing as much talking. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, well, it's good for me as an interviewee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Today. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can probably relate through your experiences. You probably relate, can't you, to those kind of three levels of confidence. One very much about self-belief. Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny because I think, I think that's why people experience high levels of confidence in the early part of their career because it kind of coincides with uh, continuous improvement and there's a lot you can get better at and will get better at so even yeah. if not everything's going to plan 
yeah. there's more that is going to plan than isn't going to plan. Yeah. But you then get to the high levels of your game and uh, and suddenly it starts to get defined by the things that are going wrong rather than the things that are going right. Yeah. And that's a time when you've got to be pretty strong. You've got to know yourself really well. You look at the top riders, and I kind of always think, if you, if you listen to any interview on YouTube with either Michael Jung or Ingrid Klimke, are good examples, they have a system. And their system isn't just about their approach to horses. Their system is also about their approach to themselves. There's a high level of self-awareness that's gone into how they operate. You know, why do I make that decision in that situation and not that decision? Yeah. Um, because it's not to say that's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do for me in the context of my system and my horse yeah. um, and uh, you can't copy someone else's system you've got to kind of develop it yourself um, so getting that deeper level of confidence right is something that you can start working on normally from the age of 13 I'd say when people start to develop self-awareness and a notion of uh, I can actually have an impact on my environment on what I do it's not just a matter of following instructions yeah um, it's a little bit more than that okay I wrote a blog a little while ago now about sports personality and watching the Olympics and you see such different personalities that you have the Usain Bolts that's yeah. a prankster and joking about and laughing on the starting line and then you have the kind of Jessica Ennis, who is just genuinely lovely and sweet. And you kind of think, how are these? And then you have the really hard people that I don't think I actually named someone, but the real harsh competitor will kill to win kind of. Yeah. Do you think the sports personnel, does that have a huge impact on? Well, you, you've, you've given <coughs> the perfect examples yourself to perhaps answer your own question in terms yeah. of, is there a right personality? Yeah. The short answer, no. 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 The right personality is your personality. And I suppose, again, again, it's an identity thing, but it's helping people be comfortable in their own skin. If you're in a warm-up arena and you're competing you know, alongside Carl Hester, Charlotte Desjardins, someone like that, the moment you measure yourself against them, you're, you're probably never going to... Uh, measure yourself favourably in no. the, against many no, criteria, true. let's face yeah. it. And it's like comparing an acorn with an oak tree. But actually, um, when people are the best version of themselves, when they're comfortable in their own skin, I think they have a much uh, stronger, more self-assured way of dealing with situations. I'm doing this because it's the way that I do it. So I think if anyone thinks that in order to be a winner, in order to be successful, this is the personality I need to adopt, this is the person I need to be, they're kind of barking up the wrong tree, they're, they're going down the wrong route. I can see why people think that, because they've seen enough people or enough riders who demonstrate those traits, yeah. and therefore I have to be like that. But there are always exceptions, always. And the difference, like you say, between Usain Bolt and Jessica Ennis um, is a classic example. Yeah. The other thing to remember about that is that if we, if we try to be someone that we're not, we use a lot of energy. We, we literally use energy in the brain because we're trying to construct a model that isn't natural. So we're not, we're not really performing <laughs> with freedom. We're, we're performing with constraints. Um, the constraints being how do, how do I need to be or, or rather, you know, how do I think I need to be and then trying to be something that you're not. Yeah. Um, and when we're at our best, there's no doubt we're performing with freedom yeah. and our self-construct, the idea that we have of ourself, is, should not be interfering with the point of performance, with that amazing moment when you just have that complete flow, that complete feeling um, with the horse where things go timeless and actually you're just there experiencing the performance. Yeah, just in that moment. Yeah. So there we go. He is so interesting. I could literally talk to him for weeks um, about things. Um, you never love a bit of psychology. Um, and it was really great. And I hope if you haven't been to a talk, do go. Um, definitely worth an hour and a half with a glass of wine. It's always good. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can do some more with him. Um, maybe he can help me beat 
my confidence crisis. Um, no, I shouldn't call it a crisis, that's bad. A confidence temporary setback, we'll go for. Um, anyway, like the video if you like it. Let me know what you think, let me know what you want to see. Subscribe below, um, would be great.